Hello, America and the world at large. Welcome to another riveting episode of What's, What's It Good, Good For? And man, are we excited. We get to do something we don't often get to do, which is... Just be the two of us. Well, there's that, too. Oh, baby. Oh, okay. But really, we have something to show you. We haven't even seen this till right at this moment. And we're going to unveil it right now, you guys. Wait, drum roll, Peter. Can you give me a drum roll? Does it start with an X? It doesn't. Oh, no, good. There's no X yes. at all. All right, here we go. Drum roll, but i got to hit my hands off. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. It's the new Allen and Heath fun. Oh, oh my gosh! I thought this was the Starship Enterprise Control Center. Well, it kind of looks that way, too. Yeah, but it's cooler cool. than that. It is. We've been All waiting right. for this for a long time. So it's so new. We don't know much about this other than the promo materials we've read. So we have actually called in a couple of experts. Yep. And we're going to bring them in in just a second. So just hang on. Yes. All right, guys. Since we know so little about this, we brought in... Kevin, and Kevin Kevin's from Alan Square. Keith, yes, Kevin Square, Kevin Dua. That works. So uh, they're going to tell us a little bit about this amazing console. I mean, look at it. It's glorious. It's like a Ferrari. Mm. Makes me so happy. It's purple, too. <laughs> and yes, lots of pretty lights and buttons. So big Kevin, big Kevin. lots of pretty lights Biggest and buttons. Kevin. <laughs> tell us about this thing. Tell um, us why the Avantis is amazing. So if you know the Allen and Heath line, um, Avantis is kind of a, a D-Live in miniature. We call it the trilogy um, completed. You know, we had this D-Live 96K chip that was programmed, gosh, about six years ago now that launched the D-Live. We put the same chip into SQ, and the third tier is Avantis. But I'm here to tell you kind of off the record and unofficially, as though this weren't going to circle the globe in social links and contacts. Um, Within moments. It's yeah. actually kind of a D-Live 3. So you've got D-Live S-Class, D-Live C-Class, and you can almost think of this like D-Live Avantis class. Same op amp, same mic pre, same processor. Uh, the GUI is reworked um, to be really pushed more onto the screen. Um, you know, I could go through bullet points of features, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's a real fast, tactile touch the least amount of things to get your job done sort of console. Well, what's the channel count on these versus D-Live? These do uh, 64 external stage inputs. That's not including effect returns, one, two, three, four, left, right, you know what I mean? So 64 actual stage inputs across 42, uh, uh, 42 assignable liquid bus architecture. Two of those are the fixed PFL, you know, for your... Um, your cans, your monitoring off the console. So really you could say 40 fluid buses. It could be 20 stereo augs for 20 stereo ears, or it could be, you know, 39 mono matrices and one mono group. Uh, turn so what them, you turn just one said there, one. importantly, is it's completely flexible. Totally. Just like our other stuff. <laughs> it is not a fixed architecture. You don't have to worry about buying just the right console. It's going to do what you want it to do. You can mm -hmm. turn this into a pretzel bent, you know, weird personalized machine for one scene of a show file, and then you can walk up to this thing, press a button, and it's the boring inputs on the left, master section on the right. You know, really, turn it into what you want. So, a majority of our business is the church world. And as we all know, church world, you're dealing with a lot of volunteers. So, why, what makes this good? for the church world, for the, the worship world? What's great about this console for those people? Because that's an important business for us. So you've got a lot of people who are semi-pros or only came up in their own sanctuaries doing sound. They may have just gotten, literally in 2019, are only just getting out of their analog consoles now. Um, this represents a pretty easy way to, you know, yank the old snake from an analog board, plug this one in, and loading a factory template, it's kind of up and ready to run. So every channel has all its stuff there ready for me to work on. If you look at much more expensive or other platforms, um, there's a lot of function changing encoders. You know, while we are all, you know, moving faders to do sends on fader type mixing, the world pretty much understands that now. Mm -hmm. It's easy, easy to explain, but literally, you know, I choose a channel or not, and I can get to a uh, compressor. I can come over here and get to, you know, a parametric EQ and then just deselect it and go away. So you have one touch access to really all the processing that's on your particular layer. 
right? There are two layers of 12, and then you've got six layers each. That's 144 potential Vader touch points. And then the way you mix on the desk is you're always mixing to the bus that's illuminated blue. So right now, <clears throat> I'm mixing mains. All these input faders are mixing out mains. Over here, I've got four aug sends. So if I hit the mix button, boom. Now this is, let's say, the master output for the drummer, the master output for the bass player, keyboard player, singer, what have you. And then I double tap it, it goes back home. So you mix to the bouncing blue ball, so to speak, and then if it's green, it's on the screen. So really, it's kind of decide processing, decide mixing. Once you get the mix button philosophy of our console, it's the fastest, lowest touch count mixing that you're really going to do compared now, to most other Talk boards. about these four. I know that these are a slightly different shade of gray, and they're not moving when you, when you change the mix. Yep. So are these static? Can you... Change them. So all of our consoles have the hallmark of being able to be completely freely assignable. <clears throat> In other words, I could put you know my kick, snare, and bass over here on these three faders. That would confuse a lot of people who walk up to the desk because people are usually used to you know inputs, master section. So what we've built into Avantis is the idea that you could create your own little fixed master section. Um, <clears throat> if I go into setup. And then I go to control, strip assign, you'll see this lock master strips button. So now when I flip different layers, you'll see that, let me get out of that, go back to bank view. Yep. You'll see that these do not change. All the other stuff on the console moves around. This is a fixed master section. Now, so could this be auxes, DCAs? Whatever you want. Okay. You just put them there and the, then they won't move. Speaking right. of DCAs, how many DCAs are on this? Um, 16 DCAs, 12 stereo effect engines. What's a DCA? A DCA is not a digitally controlled amplifier. Ooh, <laughs> trivia. <laughs> trivia. A DCA is what a VCA used to do. So it's called a voltage controlling amplifier, voltage control amplifier. Back in the old analog days, your bigger consoles, Say you want to take a drum set and raise and lower its level in its entirety without having to slide all the way you know, over to the far left-hand side of the console and grab all the faders at once. You could have all those drum channels assigned to a single VCA, and its voltage would raise and lower the drum channels. Now, the faders wouldn't move, but what it allows you to do is take clusters of things like a whole horn section which may be down on layer three on you know these four faders and then the drum set up here on these six faders and I can have them all assigned to individual DCAs and that way I can just do basic sort of level management or muting of them as a whole right <clears throat> or if I want this new feature called DCA spills I can have the things that are assigned to a particular DCA pop up from some deeper layer on the desk, I work on it and then it goes away. So for example, I've got that feature armed on this little purple button, I've turned that into a DCA spill active. And now when I hit the mix button of this, I pull up the cellos and uh, horns, you know, the strings and horns of this show file, it comes up to me, I tweak it for a minute and then put it back. Or I wanna pull up just the bass, you know, backline stuff, comes up momentarily, and then back to normal. That's really the quickest way to get around the desk, especially from a volunteer standpoint. <clears throat> you know, you can basically just say drums, band, choir, preacher, video, iPod, any of the, the normal church inputs, and you can go to mix from your DCAs. That way they're not going through pages and pages and pages. You just hit the DCA you want, you see what you need to adjust, you get back at it. Now, how many churches <laughs> in the analog days have had, for example, four hanging choir mics hanging over 20, 30, 60 people and somebody in charge at the console put board tape above and below the faders <laughs> so you can't yeah. move them, right? Because you've got all these little quarter-inch condenser mics that are sucking in all the sound from everything. you got to get that gain before feedback and just right. So this is a pretty cool trick you can do on this console. <clears throat> Something we didn't talk about is how you set it up. Imagine the, the first four microphones, sorry, these four microphones they're all under the control of this DCA, right? See, I'm muting it up. Let's just pretend those are four choir mics. And I turn them up as loud as they need to be. You know, I bust them to where they need to go. I signal process them. I, you know, and then I never want anybody to ever touch those again. So I've assigned them to the control of this one DCA. And in this screen, you can see how I lay out the console, bank one and bank two on their respective layers, right? I can swipe them off the desk. In fact, I can swipe everything off. Those items 
are still there. And in fact, if I arm the feature of spill, I can get them back momentarily and put them away. Yeah, so they're just gone from the surface. The right. audio is still passing. The audio is still passing. Yeah. You just can't get to them. So let's go ahead and put some of these things back, 5 through 12. And I just drag them down here. Man, that's easy. Yeah, yeah the box selects a big deal. <laughs> that's awesome. So these four choir mics are now obliterated, but they have been put under the control of this DCA. You know, but that DCI will not go past their maximum volume. That's correct. So, so let's say before the mics went away, I had them gained and the master, you know, their maximum input fader or send level was that. Even if I drive it up to there, as loud as it'll ever go is that, so to speak. So it's there's a lot of ways you can get stuff coming and going through the desk that the operator doesn't necessarily need to know about because you can lock this down and then just say, no, no, can't do that. You know, or that's if here awesome. your mics on that one fader, that's it. Don't touch. And then mm -hmm. once you have it set that way, you can also lock the console through user privilege. That's right. So they couldn't adjust that, period. Mm -hmm. All facilities, whether they're churches, theaters, rock concerts, festivals, there are smarter and less knowledgeable people to be polite, right? So we have um, the ability to lock down uh, user groups. <clears throat> if I look at, I don't remember where these are. Here we go. Config, user profiles. You have one administrator and then nine uh, people who can have their own passwords on a particular sofa or the console overall to get at and do what you want. So once we choose, let's say you're the administrator, you're the once every six week volunteer sound guy, you know, you get to know and do everything. And then Kevin over here has to have permissions. So we go to set permissions. Probably the first thing you want to prevent somebody from doing is, you know, all these tabs have little things under them that I can deny people, right? <laughs> I want to... The first thing you should be denied is the headache game. Yeah. Well, that and the ability to EQ outputs. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you hired Springtree for a cost of $86,000 for a half an hour to That's come it? and tune the... Yeah. Exactly. They, got, we're got, so they weren't cheap. Man. Uh, well, seriously, you have a competent professional come and tune the room. Some once every six week sound guy is going to come and go. Oh, let me, you know, let me EQ the. It's supposed to be a smile. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be a smiling face. <laughs> so we deny that operator the access to output parametrics. You go through these and you look at configuration, control setup, select keys. You know all your hot soft keys and encoder controls. You can lock everything down so that basically. You know, you have the keys to the car, you come up, and it's a fader mute machine. <clears throat> yeah. And with nine different users, they can all have truncated access to different components of the desk. Well, what's cool about that, <clears throat> in my opinion, um, something that we've used in the past with DLive, and it, it trickles down to Avantis. Um, so say on a Tuesday night, when the main engineers are not at the church, and there's a Bible study that comes in, maybe there's just eight vocal mics, you can set them up, their own user preset, and if you put it on a hotkey, they can trigger the automatic mic mixer that's in this, and then the console just runs itself. Yep. So you don't need an engineer there. You set all the safe levels. You, you you set everything they need to do, and then they come in, they push one button, all the microphones are live, and it mixes the, the show itself, basically. So that's been a, a really cool feature. In the same spirit of sort of custodial operation, you know, we like to say janitorial mode or for audio idiots, <laughs> um, we have three different boxes. This is only one I have with me today. Um, notice that I'm mixing the kick drum with this. We also have uh, a thing. This is called an IP1. And basically, this can be a one-channel mixer. It can be a source selector, so I can toggle through different output bus selections or input groups um, and have them playing in different zones. Um, so you can put this like in the lobby. I can put this in the lobby. Or a cry room. Listening or to a the kitchen. sanctuary. Press a button, and now we're listening to the ballgame. You know, so to speak. This, this is a, an external tactile controller. We have an eight fader one. We also have a six encoder version. So you could have one of these eight or six encoder versions on stage. There's no sound person present. And pastor or assistant pastor mm -hmm. or the fundraiser person can run the console in a pretty truncated way. However, the biggest question we get is, does this actually pass audio? This no. is merely a controller, so there's no it actual is. audio passing through. This is just being powered over PO. So if you look at these things called controllers, you'll see a picture of an IP8. And right now, you know, you could call these things up. I know it's just a kind of a two-dimensional picture, but you can call these things up and run them from within the console, right? So I go to Device Manager, choose an IP6. Go to Simulator, and 
you know, I can be raising and lowering or panning stuff. So I had one programmed into this show file. It's not plugged in, but you can see that we are both controlling the same third fader. These could be personal monitor systems for people with wireless packs. We have, you know, these ME1 plug-in headphone mixing stations. We've had them in the line probably for seven years or so. Yeah, you guys love those. Do we sell the snot out of them? A lot of people wear wireless packs, and they may complain about the fact that, you know, they would have to plug into the line output of this, run it all the way back to the equipment room, you know, take an analog output, you know, into the transmitter, which is racked next to it. Really, that's not a good idea. We've looked at doing it. It's not great due to the latency and the coming and going of signals involved and the essence of having to have instantaneous audio in your ears without any latency would negate that being, you know, a useful solution. So what we recommend people do is use these six fader times six layer. That could be a 36 channel controller. It is just an ethernet device. So it just, it just has a category cable. And what it would do is control a pair of outputs that would go to the transmitter. So it's a remote controller of part of the mixer that you've given it control of. Maybe it's just controlling the drummer's mix, right? <clears throat> so there's no latency. It's yeah. not an audio device that's transmitting over wire at coming and going. Basically, it happens instantaneously, and you as the front of house or monitor or console operator can come in here and help them. You know, they get on the mic, they're like, man, I just can't hear the choir that well. Well, okay, let's go over here. And, is that better? You know. So you can call up all of these things. You've got 16 of each, IP6, IP8, IP1. Uh, you can really have a, a massive pile of these things plugged in. Um, yeah, so just an example of the peripheral ways to control it. There will be an iPad app when it's uh, released. Right now we're looking at January. Uh, an, an offline editor, actually there will be two iPad apps. There's the um, engineers app. And then the self-mixing app, you know, where people want to mix themselves on iPads. Yeah, my favorite thing about this is being able to have multiple users work on the console at the same time. You know, in DLive, you've got your processing and then all your control and your I.O. screens over here. On this, you can actually configure it where you can work on both screens and do different things at different times. So watch this. We, we no longer, all the Allen Heath consoles since the original iLive has always had a green select button down here along with your mute, your mix, and your paffles. Um, we've pushed that onto the screen. So this is, in essence, your select button, right? <clears throat> but unlike our other consoles where you have to hit the select button, and then I usually kind of brag about next touch turn, you know, you'll have next touch access to gain, trim, high pass, low pass, gates, compressors. On this console, you don't even need to have selected a channel. You can just go to the processing of it. Or, you know, there's the compressor of AUX3, and here's the input gate of channel kick, channel one. So and everything's instantly time. available. Yeah, it's just there. You just touch it and you're ready to work on it. That yeah, is speaking amazing. of processing, I noticed this when you go into the gate. This little histogram down here, what's that good for? So both the gate and the compressor have a little histogram running. You can see it over here as well. Um, in the case of a compressor, it shows you the signature of the compression that happened. In the case of a gate, it's giving you more information than just a blinking light or a, or a, a meter crossing a threshold. You can actually see how fast the gate opens, how far it opens, how long it stays open, and how fast it shuts. So for those of you that crave techie stuff... Well, so, so here's, here's the gimmick, right? You have drummers who hate having their rectums gated. Amen. And why do they hate it? Because man, you're messing with my my resonance, man. My you know my, that's that's my sound. Bro. Drum heads are expensive. <laughs> that's right, but they don't change their heads, or they don't know how to tune them, right? So, here's an opportunity for you to turn the gate off. Oh, the audio's looping around. Anyway, you can see the gate operating even though it's off, and you could kind of dial it in without he or she knowing, and then just slip it on. And they'll now, never what know. That, what does that do for <laughs> latency of the desk? <laughs> well, what this is also showing you is evidence of the processing working, whether it's on or not, right? So if I go over to the compressor, and you see this histogram that's on, even though it's off, you can see that input channel compression happening, right? That's not just a cartoon moving. That is all the calculations and the math of every compressor of all 64 possible inputs running under the hood, whether you use them or not. Same with outputs. You look at output compression, you you know, it's all there, right? So why we don't drift in latency, the phase delay compensation spec 
every digital piece of gear yeah, has to have uh, you know a spec for how fast audio gets through it. You're going from electricity to ones and zeros, and then back to electricity. How long does that take? In our case, the slowest thing to pass through this 96K FPGA chip is um, 0.68 milliseconds. There is nothing I can do under the hood that will slow it down. So everything that's faster gets slowed down to 0.68 milliseconds, and all audio and all frequencies of all channels travel through the desk at the same time. And this is really just kind of an anecdotal visual proof of that, right? So the number crunching is happening. So what you're saying, the gas is pedal to the metal. Yeah. You just got to put it all in the gear. Gear. Yeah, all, I like everything. Yeah. So you've got 64 inputs. All of them have compressor, gate, parametric, high pass, low pass. Um, you've got mic pre models that are optional. There are also compressor models that are optional. Every single output of the console, every single bus output has... Uh, output, graphic EQ, output, um, compressor, <laughs> and parametric, and they're all there. They're all running. It's not like the old consoles where you had to assign something onto a bus and you're using up a finite resource. It's just all there all the time. And all of our consoles are like that, really. You're never loading it up. No. Nope. It's, it's, it's ready to it's, go. Now, some of the cotton candy, uh, which in the case of Avantis or Extra, is um, a plugins package called uh, DPAC. And what that represents is the warm and fuzzy, nice um, emulations that we've been developing over the years. If you have a DLive or you are familiar with it, you'll recognize some of these models that we have put into the console. Um, this compressor was pretty famous throughout the 90s and 2000s. Well modeled to well, bring yes. back the memory. Right, right. Good cartoon <laughs> drawing. Uh, we don't call it by its original model yet. We call it a 1-6-T. Right. Uh -huh. Say it fast. 160. 160, right. Boom. And then its uncle, you know, the VU metered version, complete with crooked cap and missing switch nice. cap over here, right? But there are a lot of these things that um, have been developed and have been added to DLive over the years. This is an 1176. You've got it in blackface and the silverface version. Um, you will pay a one time upcharge to get all these plugins uh, at once. And it's about $1,400. Um, and, and it you makes get, more sense to do it at the time of purchase. That's right. <clears throat> well, for the first many months of DLive, it's only going to be available with this upcharge package version. Down the road, maybe in the spring, you'll be able to buy it without. But we really wanted to launch the console, you know, kind of in all its glory um, and, you know, give you all the frills built in. Um, the important part about these plugins, too, is they're not just plugins, they're actually living on the desk. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, this isn't running out to a server, then back in and creating more latency. Correct. This, is, this comes with the desk. DEEP, Digital Emulation Effects Processing, is what we call these things. And they are in the chips, they are mm -hmm. accounted for in that phase delay compensation number. So, I can have all of these things running, and it would never add anything. <clears throat> um, a really nice. Um, add-in that we developed for DLive a few years ago is this thing called a Dyn8. It's a four-band multi-comp and it's a four-band dynamic EQ in one. You have, in the case of Avantis, 16 of them to put on any input channel and bus. And I love showing this. <clears throat> if, if you have any experience dialing these in, they can be a little tricky, right? So if you're looking for that annoying flat picking, uh, you know, plectrum hitting the stream frequency, the lows and the highs and mids, they can disguise or confuse your ability to zero in on that frequency. On these tools, I can uh, choose either the multiband compressor or the dynamic EQ. In this case, I chose the dynamic EQ. We have this listen feature. Right now, I am listening to the low mid frequency of that dynamic EQ through my headphones while I hunt and peck you know, the annoying frequency or the feature I want to enhance or get rid of. So that's a pretty cool little granular way of PFLing stuff. <clears throat> you can also do that uh, anywhere on the desk. If I hit listen, you know, I can just grab something. So for example, I'm listening to that parametric EQ with its gates and compressors and high and low pass filters defeated. Yeah. <clears throat> You're saying you can pretty much cue anything. Yeah. Any process individually, it'll be defeated in your cans, and then you just tap that little head button for it to go away. That is amazing. Something I like to show on compressors is, uh, let's go back to a generic one here. <clears throat> so, so we are compressing something pretty hard. We have parallel path compression built in on every input and output compressor. This is a feature that uh, largely comes from Mastering World, 
in the early days of um, digital recording. In fact, you could do this back in the analog days. Um, I tell a story of how I learned what parallel compression is. So for, for those of you who have sat in my class, you've heard this story before, but it kind of drives the point home, right? <laughs> I'm in a very well-known club in Hollywood back in the early 90s, and I get this band that's going to come in and get a record deal that night, right? So they bring their producer to bird dog me and make sure, you know, I'm doing right by them and make them sound like their album or their demo tape or whatever. And, um, you know, I start going to work on the kick drum. Well, in the early 90s, Hollywood strip pop music was glam metal kind of fading down and grunge rock coming up, right? And both of those genres of bands and music usually had enormous Tommy Lee kick drums, you know, without any hole, without any dampening. And what would they sound like? Oh, oh, oh. So I get this guy on stage and I'm, you know, I'm dialing in the kick drum and all of a sudden, you know, here's this wah, 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 wah. And I slap a gate and a compressor and I crush it and I clip it and I turn it into, <clears throat> well, the producer is coming unglued. He's like, bro, what are you doing, man? That's just so uncool. That's just not how they said, really? Is this how it's going to be, man? And I, and I analog desk, right? So I reach around, pull the compressor insert, the gate and compressor, and, you know, we go from, uh, uh, to bah, bah, and I said, you want to mix over that? And he's like, I see your point. It's not like the studio through my $10,000 TAD monitors, right? <laughs> so he said, let's do parallel compression. And he takes a, uh, an XLR splitter, and we just drop the kick drum into two channels. One of them we leave ambient and open. The other one we smash and clip, and that way we've got sort of the <laughs> bah with the bah built in. That's what's happening on our compressor models. You've got that feature on every compressor. So that's most guys today, and the reason I want to spend a little time on this, because a lot of guys know this trick now, and it's easy to do in digital consoles, they'll send the kick drum to a mono subgroup, or the whole drum set, and they call it a crush group. <clears throat> I think, you know, the kids at Full Sail learn it as New York compression or something like that. But parallel compression is on every channel, every bus. Nice. So. That's a secret weapon for getting your vocals to sit right above the mix, too. Yeah, and it's really, really nice out. on uh, double, ba uh, double acoustic uh, upright basses, too, because usually those are real boom. Mm -hmm. All right, with any digital console, one of the great things is you have your stage boxes and all your various accessories that make this super configurable and really easy to use and not involving a giant copper snake. I'm going to have the Wonder Twin powers of the Kevins here kind of go through what they have available for this, and there's plenty that's not even on the table, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. There's a ton that's not on the table, and I'm, I'm glad you bring up the copper snake because I just unloaded a truck with a 400-foot copper trunk. And threw my back out, so uh, I'm done doing 400 that. 400 foot for 400 pounds. Yeah, yeah <laughs> maybe like more. Five, six hundred pounds. It was, it was weighing the back of the car down. Um, but yeah, so Jade's right. Um, you know, with the Avantis, I'm sure we'll get some good B-roll of what's on the back of it. Uh, there is some local I/O, but if you want to expand that to take advantage of the full input structure of the the desk, you'll need to go to uh, an I/O box. And these are just some of the the smatterings of what's available. There, there's Dante versions, there's non-Dante versions, there's the Giga Ace versions, etc. I'll let Kevin kind of dive into the differences between these and what they're good for. Um, yeah, take it away. So there are 12 by 12 analog I.O. on the back of the console. Um, there are also 228 channel card slots we didn't mention early, early. But these are really the typical boxes we would expect to be sold with Avantis. There are eight different analog I.O. boxes, um, you know, converter boxes. Let's remember, it is always important to get these mic pre's as close to the musician as possible. If you take a copper subsnake system and then run it all the way to the balcony where your console is and put this, you've kind of defeated the point of having well, a it's digital also IO signal box. Loss too, yeah. After a certain distance, you get noise that comes up, and you can measurably lose high frequency, I think, after about 25 feet. Mm -hmm. and about 100, 150 feet, um, there's noise. So this is a new box um, that came out uh, a few months ago. It works with SQ. People are buying them with the SQ console. It's a 48 by 16 box. Um, this has been shipping for a couple of years now. It's a 16 by 8 throw box, and you can cascade from one box into a second if you want. And then this guy, <clears throat> this DX-164, is designed to go in any 12x12 NEMA box or an ACE backstage floor pocket or Hoffman electrical panel. And really the beauty of this guy is um, if you're doing new construction and you don't already have a copper substake infrastructure, you ought to look at installing these. 
because um, this can be attached to a building. You can remove this IEC cable. It comes with a flex uh, gland AC mains conduit connector. Or if you don't want to hire an electrician for $160 an hour, you can power it by 12-volt uh, DC. So each of these 16-channel boxes you can go into and then to a second, right? Neat little ports over here. This is the main input port coming from the snake port of the console. These can also spit out to these and these. So there are a total of eight of these. You can find them online that will work with Avantis. Um, two of them, two additional two, ten you could say, two are Dante versions of these boxes. If you just wanted a bunch of these on a stage, plugged into a switch, and then slapped into a Dante card, our console would read and write to head amp, gain, pad, phase flip, phantom power, but other sources attached uh, through Dante controller could read and write to these boxes as well. So if you're going to a third-party DSP somewhere across campus, or you're going yep. to uh, like a microphone system in this, you could do all that with Dante <coughs> controller. Correct. Uh, the biggest difference between these and the DLive mix racks are the mixing engine is in the Avant. That's a standalone device. This, this is a standalone device. DX, think of dumb expander. That's good. <laughs> Digital expander. expander. It's just yeah. a dumb box. So these are just IOs. Uh, my favorite IO box, we actually don't have it here, but it's actually the DX012, and all it is is 12 XLR outputs. So if you want to turn this into an absolute beast of a monitor desk, and you just want to have all outputs, you just stack up the DX012s on there, and you have all the outputs you could possibly have for driving in ear monitors or. Could be 12 you know, mono or. Yeah, eight you mono turn it plus into AES 16 or broadcast. AES. So there's, there's a whole lot of options, and somewhere there's a slide, but it shows you the ecosystem you can build with the stage boxes, and it just gets out of control. There are too many choices to discuss. Yeah, yeah, Call <laughs> us, we will help you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is a world, and they're all interconnected. SQ can plug into this. A Q console can plug into the snake port of one of these and be a little low-cost broadcast streaming desk. I can hang this off of a D-Live. You know, there's all, all of our day. stuff plugs and plays and works together and basically mostly uses the same I.O. box. One day yeah. happy family. So if yep. you wanted to have a D-Live in front of house, you wanted to have an Avantis at broadcast, and maybe you wanted to have an SQ in your youth room, you can network yeah, it all okay. together. Yep. They all talk to each other. All right, guys, you know, if you've been watching our videos, this was a super detailed video. I mean, we learned a lot today. I feel smarter just having been in the room with, with both goofy, these cats. Goofy side hey. stories. Yes. Uh, but we really felt it deserved this kind of attention because there's so much you can do. It's not just pretty lights and buttons. It's an amazing console. We are more than excited about it. I want to thank the Kevin Squared for showing up and uh, giving us their time. And we're going to have a long version, short version of this. So if you watch the short version and you like it, there's a long one that you'll get all the details on. Because there's a lot and it's amazing. Thanks, guys. Thanks.